Students, I think, would benefit from choosing SWAC because it gives them an opportunity to get involved at a more hands-on level earlier in their career. Students choosing to come to SWAC benefit from having opportunities at the freshman and sophomore level to get involved in research that can carry them forward in their career while still maintaining the same academic rigor as they would experience at, at a four-year institution. The day in the classroom in physics and engineering starts out as sort of a conversational approach to the material that we're looking at, whether it be solving rocket science problems, whether it be designing bridges, whether it be designing electrical circuit systems. It's usually a conversational approach that leads to a lot of questions. I always tell students if they're doing science well, they'll always leave science class with more questions than they got answers to begin with. And that's to drive the intellectual curiosity of the students. And that's what I try to do, making things interactive as possible and letting them foster that curiosity and develop those critical thinking and teamwork skills that they need to succeed as they go forward. You're dealing with a class in physics that is typically between 10 and 20 students. That gives you plenty of time to interact, ask questions. You get more direct responses from the instructor. And SWAC being a small enough school, there are instructors that you will see a number of times. So you get to develop sort of a rapport with your instructors and truly do become more like mentors than they do become teachers. The biggest thing it brings is a sense of opportunity. It gives us a chance to revisit how our curriculum works. It gives us a chance to incorporate new ideas, new equipment, and it also provides the students with ample opportunity for new projects and new developments in terms of research. The physics and engineering programs at Southwestern are a great way to begin your journey in a professional STEM career. Good evening, everybody. My name is Crystal Hopper, and I am our uh, OSGC uh, Prism Project Coordinator here at SWAC. I work with Dr. Coiner um, in the Physics and Engineering Department. Uh, we actually had um, just got back um, moments ago <laughs> uh, from Corvallis. We um, had the opportunity to bring a group of our uh, student researchers um, who have been working on uh, a lot of really um, awesome projects and they were able to present all of their work over at uh, Oregon State today um, at our uh, Oregon Atlas Experience uh, Fall Research uh, Student Research Symposium. So it's always something that uh, we all are excited to have them do. Um, they work really hard on all of these things and um, we have students that are looking for asteroids and micrometeorites and um, some are talking about uh, liquid crystals and we had um, we just had some amazing uh, model projects we have we have a lot of really great things happening uh, we have a team called Sphere, which is an atmospheric research group most of the students are part of that and uh, we've got all of those kind of ongoing research projects going on. Uh, with the PRISMS project, um, uh, which is funded by uh, OSGC, we're able to also um, this year expand up to um, our K-12 and support our local teachers with their STEM education. And that has been, uh, we've had a huge response to that. <laughs> Um, I tried to reach out to as many schools as I could, I think pretty much all of them, um, in Hughes County um, and uh, Curry, and then in Reesport. Um, and we've had teachers from uh, all grades kind of uh, reach back out and come to their, I want to come to their lab, but I have to come to them and talk about what we've got going on. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. But, um, uh, first, I'm going to say thank you and great job to the students that went earlier to Corvallis. You guys did a great job. Awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you very much um, for being here tonight. And I'm going to give this to Dr. Corner so that he can kind of tell you what we have going on. 
Thanks, Russell, and welcome to our Physics and Astronomy Lecture Series uh, event for November. Um, I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Drake Mitchell from uh, the Portland State University Department of Physics. Um, Dr. Mitchell um, and I got a chance to uh, start conversations as we were trying to iron out how to get SWAC students into this to Portland State. And as I learned more about uh, his research background, it seemed like an interesting topic that we hadn't had a chance to discuss in the uh, physics and astronomy lecture series. So I thanks for the invitation. I'm glad he was able to join us today. Um, discuss a little bit about the, the physics of diet. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're going to, um, I don't have anything as fun to talk about as uh, space and meteors and that sort of stuff. Okay. I wonder what I'm even doing in the physics department, perhaps. Um, and I've been staring at my title up on the screen, trying to figure out how many lies I put in here. Not exactly. And, and I'll, everybody will get a chance to decide to what extent I'm stretching things. So here's an outline of what I want to do. We'll spend a little time on an intro. And then um, numbers two, three, and four will be highlights, at least, you know, highlights I picked, I think are highlights, anyway, of some of my own research over reaching back a number of years. Number five will be something that one usually doesn't do, which will be research that I'm not an author on, I did not do, but I was down the hall while I was doing, and it's a very interesting story, and it's a natural carry on from the stuff I'm going to do in model systems about looking at the way things that we eat do, do change. Of course, I'm not in the, well, there's going to be a little bit in here where we actually fed something to some rats and looked at some results. Mostly, you don't get to do that. And I'll talk about you know, what you can and can't do. So, start by looking at a cell. And there's a, you know, a few hundred of pictures of cells on the internet, of course. And I picked this one because it's going to help me make the point that it's full of membranes. You look at a cell and go, you know, what do you deal with all these compartments? It'd be a little like if you opened your fridge and everything was just in there, not in any containers, that you wouldn't do that very long, right? Everything goes in a bottle or a bag or something. You want to go back and find it. So what biology does, of course, is things aren't just so they can find it and keep it separate from each other, but the doors between compartments are where things happen. Almost all the drugs we take that do anything are, are target receptors, and those receptors gate things between cells. Not just inside the outside of the cell, but across you know compartments where things get done. So that's that's part of what I want to. That's where I'm trying to aim us down to. We're going to turn the microscope on a couple more times and look at smaller things. Um, so membranes are made from fossil lipids. Okay. So if we get closer, so now I've taken just sort of, and this is really a, you know this is a cartoon cell, right? This is even more of a cartoon patch out of one of those things. We're going to see the outer membrane through almost anything. But what they've done is they're going to say the receptors and the proteins are, you know, I don't know, sort of misshapen potatoes here or something. One thing I like about this picture is it's going to start reminding us that you got a lot of stuff in here. These things are called glycolipid branch sugar chains. We just say carbohydrate, other kinds of stuff. Stuck in these little ways either on the outside of those compartments themselves with the things that come up that, oh, this is, you know, now I know who you are. I can tell because that's, that's the kind of door you have, the kind of gate that's on the outside. So this is a really old picture. I don't know how old, but this would have said that we have everybody just kind of floating around. We're going to look real closely down here. Here's the lipids I'm talking about, fossil lipids, making this little C and everybody just gets to sort of float around and that's certainly not the case. That's not the case at all. That would be an entire other talk, would be the way we think that that's organized and why we think it is. But there's a lot of subtle, you know, biophysics is sort of soft matter physics. And there's a bunch of balances of really small forces that sort of segregate this up. And there's a lot of protein. There's a huge range. Most of the end up, the cartoons are always, you know, big C and you got a few things floating in it. That's probably not right. 
If I keep looking down, I see that this thing's two layers thick. That's what we're seeing on the side here. I got water, okay. And then they're gonna blow it up for us and take us down even more. And so what we've got is a, a thing we're gonna call a head roof, a hydrophilic, a water loving head that really loves water. Um, and the oil is all in the middle. So if you take a bunch of these molecules, these individual ones, these that are shown here, and suspend them in water and just shake it, just shake it in the tube and shake it and stop. When you stop, it will make this. It's going to make that bilayer. It's going to make all kinds of weird things. You're not going to like it very much if you want to look at it. But you can sort of sort that out. But it's absolutely going to do that. The oil, oil and water don't mix. It all just comes down to oil and water don't mix. So the oil pieces will go together. The water among the parts will go out in the water. Pretty soon you've got a stable structure. So I'm gonna, what the point of this is gonna be the composition of this green area. So now I'm turning up the microscope one more time and looking very carefully at one of these molecules. And they're all, there's some variation, but mostly what we care about are things that are made like this, where they've got something out here that is gonna be the water loving part. And there's only, there's less than half a dozen possibilities that we can have in a, in a human body. Um, the green part can be lots of things, though. The green part, and that's that was the part of the point, actually the point of the whole talk, is if the green part came from what I could put there because I lived on McDonald's, I'm not going to do very well. And we'll see, not do very well, I will define as some molecular steps and we'll look at this um, population study at the end. On the other hand, and I'm hoping I have a good audience here next to the coast, if that green part comes from fish oil and other th sources of, of good fat, then I'm gonna do well. And, we'll, and I will define what well means. Um, so I'm gonna end up going through lots of, you know, sort of chemistry specific names for these things. So I'm having to go through a thing about nomenclature here. So the nomenclature is we name them, here's a name right here. Now, what the heck is this? 18,0, 22,6N3P3. That's the shortest I can make the name for this and tell you what it is. Sorry. So what it is, is we always get two chains. So what's telling me that the first one's 18 carbons long. It has no double bonds. You think, great. So I'm going to tell you what you, you know this when you use saturated fat. This is something that is sitting on your kitchen counter. It's a solid. So it's like, I don't know, Crisco, lard, whatever. This one is, I went to the extreme now, so it's a long chain, 22 carbons, six double bonds. It's got a lot of double bonds. Um, and the N3 is telling me, I'm, I'll explain that a little more, explain where the double bond starts. But this is something that would come from fish oil. This is absolutely liquid. This is liquid if I put it in a freezer in your house, it's still liquid. Um, so what makes fish oil healthy? And I'm jumping way ahead and asserting that at the beginning, but that's going to be part of the, part of the point. So what it is, is, you know, this is the kind of stuff you see this in, in health food ads and it's in eating lotion and stuff, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. What in the heck is that? So this is an example here where they're giving us a nice cartoon where I've got, this is the end that's going to stick itself onto a head group and become a part of a bigger molecule to make a membrane, this is gonna be the loose floppy. And what they're showing us is the double bonds and I can get more double bonds, it has a new name. And these are all omega-3s. I can do the same thing you say, well, how much difference can it make? I just scoot this over and now we've got this thing called omega-6. It's the only difference. So the, there's a couple of points to make here. And this is where my, my think about you are what you eat isn't really so much of a lie. So this is a, you know, mind you, this is a biophysicist explaining metabolism to you. So don't, don't go too far with it. But your body cuts up proteins into amino acids. So it's a pretty good job of keeping a stockpile of amino acids. You can make proteins out of that stockpile of amino acids. No problem. It doesn't matter where they came from. That process is pretty, you know, the way you have air there, it's not bad. Carbohydrates, everything we get is carbohydrate, and most of it is turning into glucose or other sugar. Again, they get back to the stockpile, gets used, turns into adipose tissue, in my case, or whatever. Facts are a little different. 
Your body can change them. I can go back and turn this thing into one of these other two omega-3s. But under no circumstances can I take something out of that omega-3 family and make it omega-6 or vice versa. Whatever we eat there, we're stuck with. We can do a couple things, moving it around and where it gets attached and stuff, even all that's metabolic energy, but we can't change one to the other. And it's very hard to take the McDonald's diet saturated fat and start sticking double bonds in it. That pretty much doesn't happen. We've got to start with something that's got some kind of unsaturation. It's because of the enzymes that grab onto these things to stop modifying. If it's got any double bonds in it, they're going to just say forget it. So, part two. That was part one, introducing what our, our membranes are. So this is a signaling system to study the effects of membrane composition. I step all the way back in the microscope to the eye. The back of your eye is retina. And then this is a cartoon showing that there's two, this is a really made up cartoon showing you've got two kinds of cells there that will see light. Cones, which is what all of us are using almost all the time, like 99.99% .99 of the time that are seeing color. But we also have rod cells that just see dark light. And they're really easier to work with. I bother going, I mean, the, the, what I'm going to end up doing, what my research was, was going to uh, bovine retina. They don't have, you know, they don't have cones anyway. We're just going to deal with the dark ones. But their their rod cells are like ours. So what I've got is a cell that's made with everything you would recognize as cell from that last picture, sort of from that point down. Nucleus, you know, all the little compartments. And then this whole stack is just made to hold this protein right here, the homeopsin, which buried inside of it is a form of vitamin A that's going to catch the light. If I reach into those molecules and cut that vitamin A out of there, nothing happens. Absolutely nothing happens. Um, so this is, you know, while I've got this up for a second, as a, as a physicist who started studying this, yeah, actually I did learn some physics, even though I had to learn a bunch of biochemistry to do this, when I say the photoreceptor, I got this when I got to the University of Virginia and I'm in a biochemistry department, I'm talking about the receptor. And people, when I say the photoreceptor to a biochemist, they think I'm talking about the protein. I, of course, am thinking about this little vitamin A here, which is the thing that catches the light. Later, when I'm at NIH and I'm talking to physiologists, they don't think that at all. When I say photoreceptor, they're talking about the whole cell. So it depends on where you are. So these are um, dim line receptors with dim and perfect black, which is part of the image that are seeing more. You can see a candle model of it, not cattle, but in the power. That's how, that's how good they are. So if I scoot my microscope back down, I'm looking at this little structure here, which is cut out of this stack. And this is way too busy, but this is actually the best you might come up with to tell this story. So this is, here's the outer membrane, a little piece of the actual whole cell. This is that stack. It's a membrane structure. You see a little, a little bilayer of phospholipids in here. Um, but it's completely separate from this membrane here. And it's held to hold these guys. These purple things are my photoreceptors. So from a photon of light to a nerve impulse, we start over here, and I've got a little H nu comes in, hits this thing, and it makes a shape change. That's the way this is sort of like a drug receptor. This is how drugs work that are gating things. If the drug hits and binds something, it makes a change somewhere removed from where that binding was, triggers other events. So we get the same thing, only we got an easy trigger. We just shine light on it. So we make a shape change to this thing I'm going to always call M2, short for meta 2. And it forms fast. It's got to, right? And that's that's the whole point here. So it's an active state. And active means that this big blue square is a thing called is a G protein. I'm, I'm saving its long name, sub T for, for transducing. And what it does is a couple of hundred of them. So now I've got this thing in a shape where it will interact with this G protein. So a couple of hundred of them will come by and then they will go through a, a change of shape that will kick down 
to another piece of amplification. Finally, I've got one photon event back down here at this redoxin gets multiplied by 200 of these guys, a few hundred channels, and I got a nerve impulse. This is why you can see part of it is that vitamin A is really efficient at bending when a photon hits it. So you get a, you know, you're going to get a nerve impulse for it. Um, yeah, and this is this whole amplification scheme where you get sort of a little signal and you've got one of these things sort of mediating a big change and another step mediating a change is olfaction, taste, a huge class of drug receptors. Last time I heard a talk from these people, they were claiming that a third of all the prescriptions in the world are that this class of receptors is a huge bunch of things. Some neural as a class of neurotransmitters that work this way. So you have it's a way to amplify a signal that's body seems to like. It does it in a lot of places. Okay. So the study design is so here's another, I couldn't resist this figure that shows some people spent a lot of effort to get this crystal structure of the rhodopsin. Here's the crystal structure. With showing just the backbone of uh, that G protein, this G sub T here. Here's what happens to the vitamin A. So we're going to purify rhodopsin from bovine retinas in the dark. I started doing this work before there were um, night vision goggles everywhere, so you would get really good night eyes that work with very, very dim uh, red light. Because once it's you know once it's out of the body, if it hits that that whole process I described, that's done. Now that vitamin A bent, it caught a light and bent. So we're, you know, never, never going to use it again. It's all through. In your eye, those get recycled, but you know, by the time we get the eyeballs out of the cow, they're not, they're not doing that anymore. So we get purified with oxygen. Then we're going to make fake cells, liposomes, where we can build this bilayer to specs, whatever we want, more or less. Do we want to say, okay, so we put it in different things. What does happen to the function? And we can measure that fairly easily also with light. That this is a, not a picture of its ground state, but if I give the rhodopsin a flash of light, so it goes through a change, that change shows up as an active and inactive form over this wavelength So I've got, you know, this is pretty much visible starts about there, so I'm now down into the, so I sort of have near UV and visible. So it's pretty, you know, it's not, not hard to measure. And I know that this is the active form because if I add the G protein, this G sub T transducer, I get more of it. That one stabilizes. These two are sitting here bouncing back and forth. This looks like a static picture. Oops, one more way. This looks like a static picture, but I really have a dynamic equilibrium between those two. They're trading off until, you know, somebody comes along and stabilizes and says, no, you got work to do. Stay here. And I'm going to use you to go on and do the next step. Um, so that, so I can measure this, this is kind of a, a sort of a check on the way we do the experiment too, that those two better add up. If you use an extinction coefficient, know how much stuff is there, those better add up to how much I bleached with my flash. And that's a, it's nice to have a check sometimes. So this is gonna be my activity. I'm not going to put any more, well, it'll be meta two showing up, but this equilibrium constant says more of that, that's more function. Things are working. So here's what we get as a, you know, this is a summary of a bunch of things. I'm just taking at body temperature, physiological temperature. Um, and I have a sort of a funny list of the first membranes to put up here. I'm going to call this super fish oil. Because really what you would find in real fish oil is more like this next one. But if I made both of those chains be this fish dry, that would be the most fish oil like a jam in a membrane. That's a, and, and this, this doesn't fit. The body actually puts this in, in certain places. Although you can't eat much of it, your body will make it. So I got super fish oil, fish oil. This one really is olive oil. This 1819 is called oleic acid, and that's also olive oil. This is exactly the main fat component of olive oil is this, this molecule right here. And then I got just, you know, for, to, for completeness, 
here's our McDonald's diet. Here's, you know, Crisco or lard or something that, you know, it's, it's barely working down here. So I have this really low activity. I've got high activity and you can see it declining. So one of the questions in this whole area is, so what about, we sort of know, I said we know a lot and then we're stuff we don't know about what cholesterol does, but cholesterol in general is making things rigid. It's, you know, the way it does in a membrane isn't the same as what it does in your blood vessels, making, you know, making things hard and stuff. Um, but we know that it's going to rigidify things. So this is a pretty good shot, but not a ridiculous. This is, there's lots of cells that have that much cholesterol in their, in their walls. So if I put cholesterol, one of the things, and I'm not going to emphasize, and we're going to see a few other times, that the membranes that have this a lot of this fish oil component are pretty are more tolerant of cholesterol than other things. So this kind of reduced activity by more than half. I put cholesterol in this lard. I don't get anything at all. <clears throat> I had to go back. We had to run this several times. And say nope. It just you know we are we're the vitamin A section of life, but that conformation change, that shape change, if you want, it won't even happen. We got you noticed know, like this is an asphalt or something. No so this is a little cartoon, not too bad a one, about so what they've got in here is labeled a bunch of different things that could be the sort of the host of the membrane. And they're trying to say in here that what cholesterol is always doing is making cement between molecules, things that where those two could sort of like bend and wave around and do things. Between these other two that have a cholesterol between them, they're sort of like walled off of each other, and that sort of has consequences. Okay, so pretty, pretty straight, pretty clear that the composition of the membrane changes function. No, no, no big deal. And I looked across a big range. We did a lot of other, um, a lot of other things. So what's going on in these membranes? So number three in my five part story is how do we measure what's going on in these membranes? What's a meaningful measure? And there's lots of, of uh, there will be plenty of people that say nuclear magnetic resonance is better or there's a ton of ways to do this. But we wanted to do something where we pick something that's sort of big, this molecule right here, 16 diphenyl 135 hexatriene, just to get that out of our mouth. Turn more to just DDH. So it's basically rigid, a rigid dumbbell, and it's sort of a big fat thing. And one of the reasons we liked it, besides the fact that it's that it, it's easy to see what it's doing, and I'll explain what I mean, um, is it just fairly thick. It's so big. So here it is in green, and this is all molecular dynamics simulation. So like with all those, maybe one or two grains of salt with things, but they have the size right, certainly. So we've got these, you know, so here's all my head groups, and this is phospholipids, and the chains are all tangled around, do whatever they want, because they turn the temperature up to make it look, you know, realistic. And then we've got, I sort of believe that one that's lying flat in the middle. This one right here, I'm not sure I believe. This one that's lying flat, but close up against the head groups, I don't believe. Whatever. The question is, the point is, it's got a limited number of things it can do. So we're going to try to figure out what, what among its limited number it actually does. And so we're going to use a time resolve technique. And one of the things that we can tell is to what extent does water get into this membrane? Now, I, I said that these head groups seal the greasy part from water, but not completely. And this thing is absolutely, it's nice, it has a nice bright fluorescence, but it's, it's completely killed with water. A couple of water molecules, one water molecule, kills that excited state, it won't fluoresce anymore. So we can measure the, just how long it's lit up, what its fluorescence lifetime is, and learn something about how well water gets through the head. What I'm gonna emphasize though, is that if we watch it move, and I'll explain how we're gonna watch it move, and I work hard, this is the, I work real hard, I can separate its rotational motion from its orientational order, namely how it sits. That 
why I was fussing about the way they put those green. I mean, this is just molecular dynamics. People say, well, let's put one here, and let's put one there, and oh, I like this one over here. And I'm going to show what we've done to say, well, we think it could be in these places, and this is what the chances are if you do that. Um, so if I, so my study design for this is, I'm going to take my membranes that have rhodopsin in them. I can take those same thing. I walk down the hall, and do it to another instrument, and I'm going to excite that fluorescent diphenylhexatriene with a polarized light flash. So if I measure the fluorescence at that parallel to that light flash and perpendicular over you know 50 nanoseconds, let it run for a little while not too long, and I plot the difference between those, I'm going to get an order to disorder transmission. Well, that's not obvious. I'll explain what I mean. So here's the way that, so I'm going to say, you know, I'm not going to, this is a log time plot, so I'm not going to get a zero time, but here's, you know, shorter time than I can actually measure, right? This is actually sort of run back, saying, well, it must have been back here somewhere. But what I did is this is that difference called anisotropy, and one way to think of it is if that difference came to zero, then I haven't got anything. I've got things completely tumbled around. They're likely to be this way as this. And at zero, I'm done. I, you know, I know I didn't get anything. If it's not, what I did was I, so I have to see everything's just in a round vesicle in a, you know, how can you even see anything at all? But if I hit it with polarized light, then everything along that axis is lit up. And of course, you know, vector projections there on. And I'm immediately looking from both ways and saying, okay, what are you going to do as I let that flash go away? And that flash is gone before this axis even crossed. And so what I watch is I watch it go from some kind of order, only in me, not in any order that it didn't have. I just selected something. I say, okay, here's a population I want to look at. And I watch what it does. And it doesn't come, if I do this in a, uh, in a water, you know, just a, Organic solvent or something, it would come here. We would actually you know, come back and say, okay, you take these, now they've got a random as everything else. And so the fact that these don't come to zero is telling us that they're, they're not free to rotate any way they want. Something stops. And so what I've got for my example here is back to my, you know, real fish oil, real olive oil, we're going to say. And then the olive oil plus cholesterol is pretty, you know, it's pretty obvious that, oh, I put a bunch of cholesterol here, all of a sudden that stuff can't move. You know, it's, it's just not doing it, and it's really free to move when, it, when you're doing this. So there's sort of, I want to say almost everybody else, this is the kind of work that people have done with, you know, people cook up different probes, they want to look at different things. And most Almost everyone just says, okay, so I got a kinetic process. Kinetics means something. Let's just figure out what the time constants are, which, which is not, it's, you know, you can tell that's relatively straightforward. Or you can do, I took out three slides of mathematics, including, you know, integrating Legendre polynomials. I mean, this is the physics in what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump past. I'm going to say, I'm going to. You know, I give you the, the papers are at the bottom of the slide, you can look them up, but it's not, it's not the kind of thing you want to drag everybody through. But if we work hard, we can separate the order that they have without their motion, which is going to contribute to this, and the way that their motion adds into this. Not easy, but it's possible. You can test it. So when we do that, I've got a, you know, completely separately, I've got a motion. And then I'm going to claim that this distri these distributions are the way this stuff sits in the membrane. This is why I'm fussing at the molecular dynamics people giving me green blobs that are, you know, any old way. So what do I have here? So I've got the work I did was to make this thing F theta, and then I'm going to apply it as a probability. So I have to multiply it F theta sine theta. This is, you know, D geometry reasons. But what I've got is an angle from the membrane normal. So what, what does this look like? So I got, you know, obviously, I say obviously, let's look at the blue trace, two populations. So this big one, and it's big with a white one, is basically is about 50 degrees. So this is basically around the way the chains are lined up. 
this is pretty close to the normal. Then, especially in the fish oil, I've got this other big population that's at 90 degrees. So that means it's parallel to the membrane. So that, to me, the only way you're going to make that be parallel to the membrane with the way these chains are lined up, you're going to put it down in the midplane, all the way in between, at the very middle of the bilayer where the ends of the chains are. And this fits a lot of work showing part of the way I mean, biophysicists have, have um, been their own worst enemies at various points. One of the, these, these are really hard materials to work with. That's right, one thing I forgot to say. Does everybody know why fish smell the way they do? We think that's the smell of fish, right? What that is, is a smell of this molecule being oxidized, 22, six and three. When it oxidizes, that's when you get, because I know this from working in a lab with this stuff, and if somebody makes a mistake, so you leave your glove box or you didn't do something right, you smell fish and you go, you know what? Your experiment's done. You're throwing that out because that's all going to be, you know, oxidizing will change things a lot. So a lot of work was done back with easy things to work with, with you know, essentially lard and fat. People came up with all kinds of things saying that this is why all those cartoons come out to be something along the line, well, like this one, where they say, well, you know, change are pretty much like this. The molecular dynamics people have gotten a little smarter and realized that we've got things bent around. But when we start looking at these kinds of things, which is hard to do real experiments on, you go, you know what, they curl up. They don't always want to hang out. They don't always extend. And that's part of why you have this good effect is they cannot um, go through as much motion as they'd like. So this is saying that in the fish oil containing one, I've got suddenly I've got space down in the, in the or things that places that my DPH can go. Remember that one of the questions I asked is I can put this big fat dumbbell in here. Where can it even go? Where can it even be? And we see that one of the things it does is when it has a chance, half of it, more than it, will actually go down and lie down in the plane of the middle of the membrane. The rest, I start squeezing it, I start putting cholesterol in, that population gets squeezed out. Maybe that means something. So it's a little hard to come up with a way to compare these things. And scientists like to do parameters, you know, so how do we, you know, what's the difference between these? So we looked at the way any one of these curves compares to not a random distribution, but the distribution corresponding to everything being random, okay? Um, and came up with this parameter called free volume. You know, it's not really, it's not like there's, you know, empty space in your membrane or anything. So we found that, so now we're back to some of our favorites, super fish oil, fish oil, and olive oil sort of things. Here's my metamyridopsin function parameter over here. And notice what happens if I plot it against this three volume parameter. Everything doesn't line up in a, in a line, you know, saying, okay, there's one universal way that all these things line up. But I get, if I start varying temperature, higher temperatures make both of these things change. And sure enough, they change in the same way. And this is just three, we looked at a bunch of different compositions and they all line up this way in a, in a line, in a unique line, with the steeper line being the more um, unsaturation, more fish oil like it is. So that was interesting. And then we said, well, now we replaced it with cholesterol before. What if we put cholesterol data in this data and it fits right in? So these, all of these open signals are 30% um, cholesterol and to that same membrane. So the cholesterol, we knew that it was pushing down this function, but it's changing this packing the same way. So it sort of acts like reduced temperature, especially, you notice what it's doing. So there's the first one in my olive oil. It made this 37 degrees look more like, you know, I know that that was 20, that was 30, making it see like 25 degrees. Here, this cholesterol just pushed that down to here, so that may, you know, 37, push down to, you know, something above 30. 
This is a 31, so it's not that bad. But in each case, the more double bonds, the more fish oil like it is, again, the more tolerant it is of cholesterol. That's the trouble. I mean, like it or not, we you know we get all kinds of advisories. I know I certainly have one about don't eat cholesterol and all this stuff. Trouble is, we've got a, you know almost all the cells in our body make cholesterol. We're never going to get rid of cholesterol. So making it not. I mean, this is why the you know modern advice is about keep track of your HDL and LDL. It's not like total cholesterol, but you don't want the bad stuff. So this is up to here. Everything I've done has been these fake membrane. Well, you know, they're real membranes, but we manipulated. We actually went to the um, lipid supply to a chemical company and said, okay, we want that one and that one, and we're going to make everything to specs. And so we said, that's all great, but let's look at the native membrane. So if I take that native membrane, I can change the amount of cholesterol in it. You know, it's, it's hard. I can't go reach into that native membrane, which has got a bunch of stuff. It's got a bunch of fish oil derived phospholipids in it, but it's got a lot of other stuff. I can't just reach in there and start manipulating one phospholipid at a time, either in or out. But I can with cholesterol, there's a carrier molecule called cyclodextrin, that will, if it's empty, will pick it up and pull it out. Or I can load it with cholesterol and load it in. So I take my native membrane. It's, these were, looks like about, you know, something close to 15% cholesterol. And I can load it up a ton or I can pull some cholesterol out. And sure enough, so I get, you know, I get my, there's my cholesterol effect. If I take those same membranes and go back and look at my fluorescent parameter, I'm making changes to those membrane properties in the same way. Um, yeah, I forgot to point out, notice when we're plotting it this way, um, it's not only fair, but I, I'm, I'm required to do two sets of error bars, right? And so this is a place where you get a little tricky to start thinking about what your statistics are here. But certainly I got errors in both of those measurements. Better show them both. So, the native membrane got, has got some uh, basic properties that are the same. And whatever we're measuring with this FD, it's corresponding to protein function in the same way, even a membrane that you know, nature built, not us. So the other thing that we want to do back to think about our signal transduction, and a very important part of vision, is it's got to happen fast. I mean, that's, that's the whole point. That whole apparatus, one thing I forgot to say was those rod cells have got a whole bunch of very carefully constructed things about them. I can't even go into it, but I will say it's your body worked so hard to make them that it said, you know what? We're not going to repair this. We're just going to replace it every, every 23 days, that entire cell gets changed. One of the functions of having a good um, sleep light, sleep dark night cycle, is when you close your eyes for a good long time and go to sleep, you activate some very special cells that then when you open them, reach down and grab 3% of the end of those cells and just bite them off. Just get rid of them. Fresh stuff grows in from the bottom. Part of that is there's a lot of this double bonds in here. And you think everybody used to say, well, that would be bad because those will be, you know, you can oxidize that stuff. So somewhere back in evolution, they said, yep, those are bad. You know what? We're just going to keep making good ones. You know, whatever. We last, you know, three weeks, they're out the door. We're going to put in new ones. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that vision has done. You know, the, the whole other side of it, you think about it, we don't think about it very often. The other thing with vision is when you close your eyes, you better go dark. You don't want to keep seeing. Sometimes you do. You get that uh, image from a bright flash. But your brain's got to turn that off. You, know, you can't keep seeing something. So there's a lot of stuff that's finely balanced. So we wanted to measure, oh, that's nice. Not the kinetics, but the kinetics. That's good. My, I, always, my, I give bonus points to my students that find typos on my slides, and they always do. So what I can do is I activate the redoxin at five with a flash at 500 nanometers. That's where its absorbance is the highest for this, this form of redoxin. And then if I sit at that wavelength, 
just a single wavelength, I can watch this process. And I got another log time plot down here. Only this one actually runs to a second. This isn't nanoseconds. Um, so what am I at? So this is 100 microseconds here. And I have my three favorite players, fish oil, olive oil, olive oil with cholesterol in it. And we've got some differences, certainly. The cholesterol is really slow, slower than this. But if I add, what I can also do is I measure this process and you know, sort of characterize it mathematically, not hard to do. This is the exponential rise, two chain together, I think, maybe three. Um, then I can go back and when I have my signaling molecule in, I can say, okay, how what's the time course from light flash to actually now we're getting you know a little closer. My friends who do vision work would still laugh and say, This you haven't got the vision yet, and they're still, they're still just messing around. Um, but I got a step closer, right? I'm act actually activating the signaling protein out here. So I can separate those two and look at, so what are we doing? You know, not just how much it is for, but how well does it really work? So we get these two. So this is that formation of active confirmation just by itself. And then I say, okay, how much does that get transferred on, which is, you know, what we got to do. And sure enough, in the fish oil, it's really fast. One is right behind the other. In fact, you know, to error bars, I can't really tell the difference. Um, even in the, uh, if I add cholesterol to that membrane, it slows it down, but I still have right behind the formation of my receptor is my, get my signal protein coming right behind it. Olive oil, things are lagged a little bit and they're slow. I put cholesterol in the olive oil and then this is this is just not going to work. You notice I had to put a break in here. This is something below two milliseconds. This is something longer than five. All of a sudden, whatever the process is, where I got this activated redox and said, okay, I'm here. Come find me and move on. Let, let's make stuff happen. This one just can't do it. It's just, it sits around. It says maybe, maybe not. So this would, you know, this is like, this is not going to work. You're not going to, you, you, the tiger's going to get you if that's what your signaling, your vision system looks like. Huge effect in this olive oil. So, and if I manipulate the cholesterol in the native membrane, I get similar sorts of things. So this is in that native membrane. Here's the cholesterol that we got out of this particular um, this is, this is a funny, so we, over the time I was doing this, over about 20 years, we watched the quality, we would get together with people at National Beast and say, so we're not measuring as good at equilibrium constants as we used to. Are you guys seeing that? And finally, we're all going, yeah, we are seeing that. Finally, we talked to our supplier. We're all buying from one of two suppliers in Nebraska that goes to slaughterhouses, pulls out eyes. They do this dissection for us of the retina, so they're shipping us retinas. And we started talking to them, and they said, yep. We used to get cattle that were mostly grass fed. Now we don't see any grass fed cattle. Everybody's coming off the food lot. They're all getting fed corn. And they're actually, their uh, membranes were changing, you know, enough that we could all see the difference. Which is a little like, so this, I say this one, you know, did different things out of a batch. So we put a bunch of cholesterol in, we took, we took some out, and these lags are a little more. This may, be telling us something about what the native membrane, how the native membrane is different from our made up membranes. Not a huge surprise, but we have the same basic effect. With this, you know, high cholesterol means that signaling step is just shut down. This is always dangerous when your speaker can't see a clock. Um, one way or another though, I'm on to step four. So, I back there a little while, I said that, okay, one of the things about diet is you can't change this stuff to this stuff. And this is one of the two, one of the places where things get talked about a lot. And I don't know, used to be just health food stores. And now it's all over the place about, you know, bio omega-3 margarine and stuff. Um, but some, if it just says polyunsaturated, it can mean this. 
So one of the things we wanted to look at, we're, we are, this is at NIH, and we're talking to people that are really doing diet and thinking carefully about what happens in human bodies and how we feed things, is if you just don't, if you can't make this molecule as 22,6 omega-3, you don't have anything to work with, your body will work hard and make 22,5 omega-6. I don't know. So how much difference can there be? What's the difference in receptor protein function? You know, your body's not going to make a lot of it, but there's a few places. One of them is the membranes are holding out the dopsin has got a bunch of this. Three places where there's a really significant amount of this. Those membranes are holding photoreceptors, breast milk, and sperm heads. You think that you'd think there's no commonality there. I think there is. That's a that's a different talk. Um, but there's there's properties to the bulk membrane that uh, this is imparting in all those beings. And that's when I said that, you know, so that's one of the reasons you got a bunch of this in your eyes and your body just says, okay, it's going to oxidize. Just turn it over. So we, this is the kind of thing you only do with NIH pretty much because getting these two things synthesized, we actually ask for custom synthesis. That one you can buy off the shelf and it's not cheap. Exactly, either, but this is actually going to be able to do a good job and say, okay, make us this. Because we want to do this experiment. So if I look at 37 degrees C, so I here's Gus going through just trying to get as much information as we can. We, we're running through a temperature series, and these lower temperatures, eh, I don't know. I'm not going to claim there's, there, there might be some statistical differences in here, but it's nothing dramatic. Finally, we get out to physiological temps, and this, the lipid you would get if you had omega-3 deficiency just isn't doing as well. I mean, it's really down a third, a quarter, and what it will do, the longer chain, the omega-3, even with the bond pulled out, it's doing fine. So if we, Sort of a better way to get at how well real signaling is working is this kinetic stuff. So this is probably too much. I mean, let's just let's just so I simplified this down by looking at the native fish oil derived and the one that your body would make if you have omega three deficiency. And what I've got is this was given to a, this is a slide left over from talking to real. Um, Biochemistry, biologists, so I put the little star saying, yes, these are statistically different. These, you know, by the way, the air bars are there, right? I, you know, I, I couldn't claim there's things going on here. This formation of this activated complex, where I've got now I've got the signaling protein working, I have huge differences between these two. A little bit, you know, this is just that uh, the time to get the redoxin form, and it's really fast. I had to make this act as sort of goofy because at 10 degrees it runs really slow. But down here is a little more sensible where I've got my real fish oil membrane is going quite fast. It's going really slow to make this 22.5 and 6. So at physiological temperature, the omega-3, the real one, forms my meta-2 state and makes signaling proceed. This is about six times faster. So again, this is running so slow, you're just not going to do well here. The tiger's going to get you. Okay. So that's the end of experiments that I actually did. And now, so I spent 15 years at NIH in a sort of a big group, a lab at NIH is what most of us would recognize as sort of a large academic department. Maybe 10 or 15, you know, PIs running experiments and stuff. And so literally down the hall from me was this guy, Joseph Hibbley. And he wanted to ask a question about, for infant child development, do the good effects of a maternal fish diet, or a maternal diet high in fish, outweigh the bad effects of nothing? And this wasn't a question he just pulled out of the air. I'll, I'll show you in the next slide why he said, all right, damn it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some collaborators in England that have a really marvelous data set. We're going to see what we can do. Um, so here's a reference for this, if anybody's interested. It's a really good 
It's been cited about, I think the last time I looked, it's been cited 700 times. So this is a quote from your intro. He says, in 2004, advice was issued by, jointly by two U.S. government agencies, really FDA, for pregnant women or women likely to become pregnant to restrict their overall consumption of seafood to 350 grams a week to avoid fetal exposure to trace amounts of neuroplasm. Really, they mean methylmercury. However, such control of seafood could cause intake of long-chain omega-3 fatty acids to fall below quantities adequate for best fetal neurodevelopment. Because Dr. Hibblin was doing his own experiments and watching ours and stuff saying, yeah, you need this. So we analyzed an observational cohort study, I'll talk about how they did this, called the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children to assess whether advice is successful in providing protection. So 340 grams is about two sandwiches. It's not nothing, not a lot. But here's the, what the real, the real background is. We're sitting there at NIH with a bunch of people who are working on some of this. One thing I didn't, I could have put in here, one of the things that was one of my most interesting times at, at NIH was when there was a, when I started working at NIH, you could not put this compound, this omega-3 that I keep talking about in input formula. It was forbidden to put it in. And then actually the formula makers liked it that way because they didn't want to have to deal with keeping it safe and making sure it's easy to oxidize and make it expensive and stuff. They said, that's fine. And a bunch of people came, some few people from my lab and several you know, clinicians and pediatricians came and practiced with us behind closed doors to go testify to Congress to get the law changed and, and did. So that's, this is the kind of place I was at NIH. So FDA issued this advisory, scary women, maybe everyone, about the dangers of too much fish. Okay, too much fish, you don't want to do it. So Dr. Hibblin is the kind of guy who just asked him, so how did you come to this? What data did you use? Why 340 grams? You know, how did you decide this? <laughs> after going back and forth, after him cursing and gritting his teeth, he realized they were going to give a straight answer. I'm going to go contact these people in the UK and collaborate on a thorough test of this why it's 340 grams for the least dangerous in life. So this thing in Avon had been running for more than 20 years. It had this huge amount of data. I think they started off enrolling pregnant mothers. Somebody smart way back and said, we want to know what, we don't even know what's important. We just want you to write down everything. And oh, by the way, we'll pay you for everyone you turn in. So they had, I'll show you the numbers. They had good, they have really, they have robust enough numbers to answer these questions. And they said, and we want to know what happens to your kids. So we're going to also pay to track their weights, test, you know, various aspects of IQ. IQ is sort of tricky when you're like six, seven, or eight. So do like verbal IQ. There's a bunch of, you know, can you follow a task stuff? Social development up to third grade. At the end, you know, the way Joe would explain one of these is so, how many times is your third grader in your principal's office? You know, yes or no, sort of thing. So they divided the mothers into three groups those who ate no seafood, you're going to see that's the smallest group, meaning it is England, right? Those who follow the advisory just happen to, and those who ignored the advisory and ate more. So they had a little bit of work here. So here's their number. <laughs> There's going to be various ends will change at various points. So they're going to, you know, the outcomes, they're going to end up, they're going to try to say, here's something about the way these kids, you know, the health of these kids. And they're, you know, that's a tough thing. You're going to population, you know, lots of things protect health and well-being of small children. So they can get, this is one of their things they call confounders. Education, housing. This basically means was it, you know, were they renting it from the township or the or the um, the council of the city? Um, how many was there more than one person in a room? Life and this is sort of code for things like immediate deaths or deaths within some you know relationship range, divorce, you know. Intense, you know, it was a parent hospitalized, and the parent was hospitalized for months, that would count as a life event. Uh, partners, maybe really, you know, for most of these, you got a few. Uh, 
uh, mothers that don't have partners, maternal <clears throat> age. And what they had to do was show that none of these things were so different that they couldn't use them. What, I mean, there's a lot of these. People who do population studies understand statistics way more than the rest of us. So here's the next page, and it goes into the whole thing. Maternal smoking in pregnancy, alcohol in pregnancy. Did they stop? Did they keep on? So you can see how this is what it looks like. They said, you know, so a quarter, so between 12 and 20 percent, kept smoking during pregnancy. Okay. More kept drinking. You know, this is sort of like half kept drinking. Okay. This was in the 80s and 90s. So here we are. Um, parity is how many other kids there are at home. Did they breastfeed? Gender of the kids. Ethnic origin, we are in, you know, small towns in England, so we've got 98, 99% white, so we didn't have an ethnic variation. So they ran statistical tests on this and got okay to say, okay, now you can make comparisons. And here's one of the, so the paper's got a few figures, I just have, I just have a few of the things. So what they looked at was likelihood of suboptimal things. So this was verbal IQ at eight years of age. And in case you can't read the, so now, now they're in, so the ends are changed after they report their ends. Their ends are always lower with a larger age group, people move away, drop their kid out, whatever. So they still got 580 in their smallest group at age eight, which is pretty, pretty sad. So they're saying things like this. So this is the ones that ignored the FDA, you know, just happened. Um, and those who follow in two different groups. And even the difference between the dumb and the sum group is pretty striking. Um, likelihood, so the other one they looked at, among the ones they looked at was fine motor skill at three and a half years of age. They're even seeing a difference in this. So this is likelihood of suboptimal score. Probably all of those are significantly different. Um, this is an interesting one, the pro-social score, which is basically positive social interaction. This is the one that Joe would say, this is like, you know, are, this, are these kids that, you know, they're going to school and they like can't get along with their friends and they, you know, they get fights on the playground and stuff um, or not. And so this was right on the edge of statistical significance. You can see there's a trend here. These error bars sort of all overlap each other. It's not quite the other one. And this one, like I said, I don't understand statistics. This was at age seven, another um, aspect of social development also had this downward trend. I'm pretty sure they're not gonna come to those two. But the kids whose mothers ignored the FDA's advice did better, even with this. They took one, this one was especially interesting to them, the suboptimal verbal IQ score. And I didn't, I can't remember what the end was for this. But there's enough detail in those food questionnaires that they said, okay, we're not just gonna do grams of fish, let's actually look at what kind, what we think was their omega-3 consumption. Cause they're writing down, you know, had a pound of mackerel or, you know, eight anchovies or whatever. They got enough information, they can start to do some things. And they get this relationship of, so this had to be, you know, so they got some zero, this is the zero group down here. And then just how much omega-3 did these moms eat? And the more they ate, the less likely they were going to have a low verbal IQ at age eight, all the way up to age eight. So they like to say, they summarize by saying this, the 2004 FDA summary aimed to reduce potential harm from pollutants. Results show that the risk from losing the benefits of nutrients essential to neural development exceeds the risk of exposure to trace concentrations. In conclusion, we've recorded no evidence to lend support to the warnings. He didn't put in here the damned FDA, but I know Joe wanted to, um, that pregnant women should limit their seafood consumption. And then this was the one I'm sure, <laughs> I, I, I can just see him writing this one. By contrast, we noted that children of mothers who ate small amounts per week were likely to have suboptimal neural development compared to mothers who ate more than the recommended amounts. This is him coming as close as he can to saying, you know, everybody who ignored the FDA did better. 
The other, yeah, in other words, eat more fish. The other part of this story, this um, this whole thing back and forth between, you know, two sort of a really a regulatory agency. This is why the FDA didn't want to give the time of day. He says, you're not a regulatory agency. You guys just, you know, go off and do some science somewhere, you know, publish in some journal or something. We're going to tell people what they can and can't eat because we're that's, that's who we are. Um, so when he first put this paper together with his British collaborators and everything, they sent it to the premier American medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And they sort of took their time reviewing it. He sort of, usually when you're in that position, the last thing you do is call and call your viewer and say, so what the heck are you guys doing? You don't want to do that. But he finally was doing that. And he finally got, I think he got an email, somebody told him verbally, he said, look, Joe, we, New England Journal of Medicine, are not going to record read through the FDA and NIH. So they sent it back to him. He says, all right, damn it. So that's why he ended up sending it to the British Medical Journal, to the Lancet, who was said, round will referee between those two any, any time. Besides, you know, this is a study done in our country, so we think it's good work. Um, and in closing, I had a long list of people that made this possible, people at NIH. Much of this work started at the University of Virginia with these fine people and I have no idea if I'm at full time, but I'm out of slides. <laughs> but time for questions. We have time for questions. If anybody has any, uh, feel free to slip up and. Yes. Uh, my question I just, when you said that, that the, the boat of well, the cow's retina was different after eating corn? Like, what do you mean? How is it different from grass-fed cows and corn-fed cows? What do you guess? You know, lack of omega-3. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, the way, the, what we measured was, so you, you know, you do this, you know, there's just kind of two levels to do this. You got whole tissue, you got retina. Yeah. And you do some things to get out that little closed structure it just got rid of and you need to get rid of all the crap. So we got that. And so we say, okay, how well is this working? And we can put it in our machines and measure, you know, that equilibrium constant. And it's just going down. And, every, you know, and somebody would measure that. To be honest, that would be the kind of thing is sort of almost a little routine. You give it to somebody who's sort of new in the lab and people will come around and say, well, you're not really doing it right. And then that's why we sort of gradually are talking to each other in, in different groups around the country. And we're going, oh, yeah, we're seeing it down. I don't know, a third, a quarter, pretty soon it's down a half. Oh, the lining itself. Yeah, so, and then, you know, we're not, it's a ton of work to actually do a chemical analysis on all that lipid. Nobody's springing for that. But we're going, oh my God, this is all, because that, there's precursors for omega-3s in grass. So see, cows are like us. You give them omega-3, my guys still turn it into the omega-3 they want. Enzymes go to work. It's, you know, if it's, Omega six, if it's corn, you know, grain stuff, you're stuck. You just can't do it. So it's so we are. You know, they were running that. Uh, you know, sort of the stuff I'm showing. Where okay, if I build this membrane, that works so well. We're seeing it coming. You know, in the retinas we're harvesting, we're going. Omega-3 is in things like flaxseed and hemp. Does it have the same quality as fish? Do you know? Uh, yes. Yeah. No, flax is a good one. Flax has plenty. And that's part of the sort of a um, without, you know, if you've got a normal healthy metabolism and you've got, a, like I say, you get an omega-3, your body will turn it into the omega-3 it needs. And there's not, you know, there is, you know, and that's this is one of the things they've always given you with a well, this is more available or something. And I'm kind of going, huh, I wonder how they're doing that because we all have, you know, we've got a bunch of metabolic enzymes that want to, you know, cut things and make things and move things around. They need the right starting materials. Yeah, I think flax is, flax is, you know, I'm talking of fish oil because I want to look at the thing that I know comes out of fish oil. Flax is great though. That's a good source. Do you have any other questions?
Well, Dr. Mercy, the back. I'm not really sure how to word this, but it, it seems like the one of the big differences with the adding cholesterol and the different fatty acids uh, results in a different level of fluidity in the membrane. So, how does the fluidity affect how effective rhodopsin is? Is that known? Exactly how? Yeah, or why is it? Why does rhodopsin work so much better with the more fluid membrane? As opposed to one that's more rigid. No, I want to be careful. One of the so one of the things we do is we say, okay, we're seeing it. What does it mean? And one of the nice things I, whatever, it would have been a different talk to go through is that people have got gotten quite good now at looking at okay, so here's red option in the dark. It's just kind of compact, and we have this, and then light hits it, and then we're going, you know, really fast. We've been looking at 300 nanoseconds. We can see this shape change. So one of the things we're finding, so there's definitely, you know, some movement around, you know, we know what those movements are. And so what the, what it's coming back and telling us is those movements are actually pushing against the membrane. It matters what they're pushing against. And that's part of, you know, we sort of, you know, we're doing this, we don't know exactly what those no. movements are. But those movements are turning out to be fairly significant and they're not just, you know, think about it, you know, this is, it's sitting here like this, and this signaling molecule is going to come in on the top, and it's going to leave. And so, who cares what's going on down here? Well, it turns out that matters a great deal to even to these people out on the outside. And and you're right. I didn't use the word fluidity in there because I'm trying to make a point of that we know a little bit more about whether or not it's fluid or not. But it, at the end, it comes back to that. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's like it needs a certain amount of elbow movement. I would say. That it needs elbow room deep in the membrane in that place where my diaphragmal hexatrion is going, oh, nobody down here. I'm going to just lie right in the middle since there seems to be room down here. And that's so far from where the action is for the protein. It wasn't obvious to anybody that that would make a difference. But I, you know, by, by correlation, we would say it does make a difference. Those are the membranes that help it. Yeah. I would. There has to be some reason why they say that. It can't just be like they just put it there because it's a random number. Do they have any data at all, or is it just something they made up? I don't know if they the, the 340 grams. Yeah. I don't know if they ever. They sort of. They they have modified since 2004. They've modified that advice. They don't exactly. I mean, this is the government. They don't exactly eat their words the way they ought. Sorry. Um, but we never got from them how they came to that 340 grams. I don't know. Somebody knows. You know, and it, it was the thing is about we sort of knew because we had thought a lot. You know, I say we. This was like this big group of us. Uh, but, you know, I'm the physicist off doing these little nerdy things on the fake membranes, and they're off. You know, doing feeding rats and. Um, doing a ton of stuff. Um, but we sort of knew from the methyl mercury stuff that there was this was a certain amount of bogus in a way, because the methyl mercury came from pretty severe outcomes for young kids around a couple of bays. I think one was in the Philippines, one was in Japan, where there was big, you know, we're talking a lot. You know, they're, they're eating a huge amount of their diet is fish caught in those bays. And a huge amount of industrial waste is getting dumped into it. There's no question. These are things you don't want to do. And so far, you know, nobody, you, you can't just start running these experiments. Well, we're going to take a bunch of humans and dividing it, you know, these get placebo and these get methyl mercury. We're going to see what happens. So you sort of have to look at what you have and be a little careful. And so they somehow they came to this off of those studies. I don't know how. They modified their um, my my physician, when I got to Portland, was talking to me about, you know, so what do you do? Da, 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 to help. And I go, I try to eat a lot of fish. And he's going, oh, really, you shouldn't do that because it's got mercury in it. And I sent him this paper. <laughs> and he, I just, you know, and he never, you know, he's a physician, he's a busy guy. He never said anything, he never came back to me at all. But when I saw him again, you know, I'm not as good as I ought to be. It was probably two years later, not one. He's down to saying, yeah, okay, and, and how's your fish consumption? I'm going, you know, pretty good. He's going, okay, good. He didn't say anything. He just, yeah, check. That's good. Move on. Then this, is, you know, has the power to change some minds. But yeah, they never really, 
They never really said, yeah, that's what we're doing. They just said, well, maybe there are some good things here. Maybe there are some other confounding factors. That <laughs> I think what they did, part of, I like the question about flats. They said, okay, you got to have omega-3s, but try to get it from something that's not seafood, even though, you know, you want to be a little smart about this. You're not going to take your fish out of places where there's industrial waste being dumped, right? We're, gonna, we're not going to do that. Uh, but there are other places to get omega-3s. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'm sure if there, I'm sure if there are any, as as we uh, wrap up, I'm, I'm sure uh, Dr. Mitchell will give us a, a few more minutes if if you guys have any individual questions. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, we try to do this at least twice during each term of the academic year. Uh, one of the ways that we that we support this is we do have. Um, some donation funding through the foundation as well as through uh, through a little bit of our space grant results. But we also have our little donation uh, box outside. If you like to see these types of um, talks, the, there there is a donation jar. Feel, feel, feel free to contribute should you choose to. Um, we we are greatly appreciative of, of everyone. If you did not get a chance to sign into the sign-in sheet, make sure you do so. I, I know a few of my colleagues uh, and myself may or may not have mentioned the fact that that this could potentially be extra credit for certain classes, but you actually have to have proof of people being here. So signing into the sign-in sheet is usually the best way to do that. So uh, thank you guys for coming to support. Our next physics and astronomy lecture series event will be uh, January 19th uh, when we when we get back from winter break. Uh, that one will actually be a virtual event because one of my colleagues from Southwest Research Institute, Dr. Tracy Becker, will be talking to us again about an update on the Europa Clipper mission. Uh, she was uh, one of our guest speakers a couple of years ago and one of the first ones that I did during the during the COVID era of these uh, of these um, lecture series and and Tracy is a is a great speaker that brings a lot of the interest about astrobiology and the things that could be existing in the undersurface ocean of of Europa to somewhat tangible places that we can actually that we can actually all investigate. And so, with that, thank you guys for coming, and I will let you guys go.